Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome everyone to our second in what we believe will be a series of workshops and breakfasts where we talk about issues related to Africa. I'm Congresswoman Karen Bass. I serve on the subcommittee of Africa, Human Rights, and Global Health. And um, we wanted to come together today to address uh, very important issues as we are just a few weeks after the 50th anniversary of the African Union, and I was fortunate enough to be in Addis for the last couple of days of the uh, meeting of the African Union, and I just can't tell you what it meant to sit in this absolutely beautiful building with 54 presidents from over the continent. And it certainly felt like uh, a new day, Africa moving forward, and a real opportunity to bring about change on the continent and obviously our role here is to bring about change in the United States and our relationship uh, to the continent. So our theme for today is U.S. competitiveness in Africa, leveling the playing field. And I want to acknowledge uh, the co-host who will probably be dropping in at some point this morning, uh, Chris Coons, who is the uh, he was the chairman of the Senate Committee on Africa, Elliot Engel, who is the ranking member of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House, Chris Smith, who is the chair of the Subcommittee on Africa, and Senator Flake, who is the ranking member of the uh, Committee on Africa in the Senate. I am very honored to be joined by two of my colleagues, one who is a veteran and a leader and has been in the House for many years and is my personal mentor, uh, Mr. Rangel, and then a new member. a great panel and I want to, to listen to as much as I can and also get have you have a chance to, uh, to to meet for some of you and to uh, get to know Don Payne. Uh, there is no question that uh, for a long time uh, there appeared to be the difference to this great the continent. Then along came from California the former speaker of the state legislature and I sat next to her before she went just after she was sworn in and to find out just what this California bill she was going to do to take over the House of Representatives because most of the people from California there's something in the water they drink, but of course they don't think that way. <laughs> and when she told me that she was primarily concerned about the future of Africa, as well as foster care children. And I knew that the Congress in our country had been blessed with someone that was driven by the things that made our country so great. So under her leadership, I'm looking forward to a better working relationship uh, with Africa, and hopefully soon uh, it will be the United States of Africa, the United States of America, where people can think in terms of better quality of life, of rather than the power struggles that are going on since civilization. So publicly, Karen, uh, let me thank you. And if you don't mind, I'm going to use uh, my seniority to introduce Dr. Of course. <laughs> because uh, Don Payne and I used to joke, uh, uh, I have supported uh, his uh, competition with Peter Regino for many, many years. And Don Payne would get money for Congress out of Newark, never forgot it. Uh, and he would sometimes remind people in Newark that if I had endorsed him instead of Regino, he would have had just as much seniority as I had. But that being as it may, we were fortunate that in the great city of Newark and the state of New Jersey, that Don had done whatever father hopes and dreams, and that is to, to have a son that not only had the vision that he did, uh, but was capable to follow in his giant uh, footsteps and to have the same concerns for our country and this community. So we are blessed in the caucus and House of Representatives, and, and of course in the entire Congress, uh, to have young Don Payne with us. He's quite a guy. 
and uh, once you get to know me, you'll be done. Let me uh, say it's a real honor and privilege to be here this morning uh, to listen to the discussion in terms of uh, the continent. I uh, know most of you knew my father and his love and, and desire to see the continent move forward. And I am just trying to learn <coughs> the issues so I can continue to be supportive in that. In that manner. So it's really a learning experience for me at this point in time. But I had a great teacher, and I understand the principles and the values for which he stood for. So I stand in that gap to try to continue the legacy that Congressman Donald King Sr. initiated uh, throughout the continent. So I'm just delighted to be here, and um, I'd like to thank Ms. Bass for being so kind and helping me on this learning curve as well. So uh, it's just really an honor and privilege to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Payne. Um, our question for the day is, how do we increase U.S. private sector investment and trade on the continent? You know, a couple of months ago in Los Angeles, we brought representatives from some of the same agencies out to meet with business people in LA because so many people are interested in doing business with the continent who they don't recognize the support that the US government actually gives to businesses who are interested in. So we thought it might be a good idea to have the same representatives come here today. And I know in the audience, many of you who have worked on Africa issues for years and years are very well aware of the resources. But we thought we would kick off the panel today, and I'll introduce our moderator in a second, and each person will present, and then we will open it up for a dialogue, because we do realize that we have lots of people here who have business ideas. I've heard of a couple of them already. They might want to share those. They might want to point out some of the strengths and places where we have challenges and need to strengthen our ability to do business in the continent. We are very fortunate to be joined by Dr. Sharon Freeman, who is the chair and CEO of All American Small Business Exporters Association. And she's recognized as the leading expert on trade and development and is a prolific author who has written and published more than 14 books. And so she will lead us in our discussion today. Join me in welcoming Dr. Freeman. Thank 
um, during the Obama administration. So we started about four years ago in 2009, at $2.5 in portfolio, and now we're at 3.75. Uh, and that's growing faster than any other continent uh, in our portfolio. It's grown from 4% of our total portfolio in the 80s and 90s and, and zeros uh, to over 25% today. And again, as I say, it's growing fast. So what kind of deals are these? Well, it's everything from, on the small enterprise side of things, uh, a farmer, a, a, a horticulturalist in, ten, in uh, Tennessee, um, discovered Rwanda and decided he wanted to bring his skills to Rwanda to see if he could work on bringing better seedlings and better propagation to that country. So with $3 million, uh, $3 million and a 20-year loan only, uh, OPIC financed this support of both of us to go and bring his best technology, best U.S. technology to Rwanda. And so far the results show that we can multiply by 10 times the productivity by per hectare by his, uh, his, his work in that country, which is very, very important. And by the way, he's going to be breaking even and making money uh, within a couple of years' time. At the larger end of the scale, the California-based business, Sun Edison, uh, opened his grant Sun Edison in a number of countries throughout the continent. Most recently, Sun Edison um, is building a big, large solar power plant in South Africa as part of that country's effort to shift to renewable clean sources of energy and open to providing $150 million to Sun Edison to build that first ever utility scale solar power plant in, in South Africa. So just two quick examples. Now, when I think about situating OPIC as was the question amongst our competition, uh, this is a much bigger topic than one that I can't address in the time we have, but I hope we can come back to it in the Q&A. Suffice it to say that there's been a very strong trend over the last 40 years since we were created towards private sector, the private sector role uh, in development. So 40 years ago, um, under President Nixon, OPIC was carved out of USAID and created as a separate entity because the feeling was that the private sector needed a special place with real bankers and, and, and real hard financial skills to support the private sector's role in development. And as I think we all know, 40 years ago when this happened, most of the money flowing from the U.S. out to emerging markets broadly was in the form of overseas development assistance, ODA. 85% of it, in fact. And only about 15% of it was foreign direct investment, private sector capital. Now, 40 years later, I think we've all heard that number is completely flipped, and 85% of the money is going from the U.S. to emerging markets is now foreign direct investment. So it sounds like President Nixon's decision was actually quite prescient. Now, in those intervening 40 years, what we've seen is that, similar to OPEC, development finance institutions exactly like ourselves, or similar, have been created in almost every developed country in the world as more and more the notion of foreign assistance and foreign aid takes the form of commercial support to private, private investment. So now there's 18 or 19 um, of these development finance institutions throughout the world, and they're growing incredibly quickly. Uh, in the last 10 years, for example, we've seen the GFIs all together. 10 years ago, we were financing around $10 billion a year in investments in emerging markets, and now that's grown to uh, almost $40 billion. And that trajectory keeps on growing. So I would love to spend some time maybe in the Q&A talking about how we position ourselves vis-a-vis -vis China. I actually think we have it's an opportunity and not a threat. Um, how we're positioned vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Um, what our challenges are uh, in terms of size, in terms of instrument, in terms of what's holding us back, and indeed what I think the real big opportunities are, not only for OPEC, but also for our U.S. government colleagues, and for business uh, investing on the continent. So with that, I welcome your questions later on, and I look forward to hearing my colleagues uh, give their questions. Talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, it's on. Oh, it's on. Okay. Thank you. Um, a lot of exciting things there. Um, most exciting of which is that uh, Africa now represents 25% of your portfolio. Thank you so much. I know we're all trying to get a to uh, ask questions, but what we will do uh, is have everyone speak first, so hold on. Uh, and before we introduce the next speaker, we'd also like to uh, introduce Thomas Meadows. Can you please say a few words? Thank you very much for being here. My apologies for being here late, but it's uh, certainly something that is a, a critical thing. I wanted to come and uh, support Ranking Member Bass, and, uh, and the 
pediatrics. It is, it is something that's truly bipartisan. It's, it's one of those things that we look at an investment in Africa and going forward. Uh, we've got to make sure that we're in a place where we can do that effectively. I know I've, I've talked to Ms. Littlefield before about, about that. And as we look to invest in Africa, it is opportunity that uh, will provide multiple returns in a variety of ways. And so I look forward to hearing the, the uh, comments and questions and answers. So thank you so much. about this 
is this is an opportunity for both small business and large business to give people an opportunity leveling the playing field people who may not have the opportunity to go abroad <coughs> with project sponsors in the United States and as a matter of fact um, over the past year, we sponsored 50 reverse trade missions. But two that I wanted to mention focused on the agribusiness in Africa. And as a result of those two reverse trade missions, we brought delegates from seven different countries to the United States. They met with 50 companies. And as a result today, there is interaction, trade, contracts. There are $13.5 million worth of business. And as a matter of fact, we just learned last week that one of the firms from Zambia has another $1.5 million. So these are small businesses, large businesses, focused on, again, the technology, focused on irrigation, production, and cold storage. But as Elizabeth pointed out, all of this working together goes to providing for food security, goes to economic development. The other thing that we have done is we recognize this question, how do we level the playing field? And what we've heard from U.S. business and also from our African partners is that oftentimes during the procurement process, they have to focus on lowest cost. Oftentimes, too, they've also learned this is a, ve a very difficult lesson because low cost doesn't always mean best value. So what USTDA has done, and we believe that U.S. business has best value, so in every one of our project planning activities, we have included a provision with respect to life cycle costing. What that means is we are preparing for each one of our partners a methodology by which they can look at the cost over time. And we believe if they have that, then they're going to have an ability to choose American. And that they're going to have ultimately what they want, the best products that are going to afford to last. And as we're running close on time here, the last thing I want to mention, and I think this is extremely important, and I talked to many people about this earlier this morning. I've been involved in this area for over 30 years. I've seen you know, different times in the US government, and this government is working together better than they have ever in the past. We have breakfast together, we travel together, but I think one of the incredibly exciting things is that we, as part of the Doing Business in Africa, we developed a clean energy development and finance center in South Africa, where the agencies are working together to focus on clean energy. So this is basically located in Johannesburg. The agencies are there. It's a one-stop shop. It's collaboration going from USTDA and preparing projects to OPIC and Exim Bank to financing the projects. And one of the things we're doing is we're meeting the competition with respect to financing. Because other countries are bringing financing as part of the sweetener for their companies. We have to do the same thing. We have to provide the financing as part of the package. And this is why it's so important for meetings like this morning and for the agencies that are represented here to be able to be working together, to be able to be staffed, to be able to work and be working closely with U.S. business. So our goal at USDA is clearly to level that playing field. And I think if we do that, we'll develop those partnerships. It's going to see even greater growth in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Those are uh, two cuts on financing and also insurance. And, and now we're going to move to the Department of Commerce, another important contributor in, in how we position ourselves to uh, compete in Africa. I have the pleasure of introducing Mike Massenman, uh, who is the Executive Director of Export Policy, Promotion, and Strategy at the Department of Commerce. And uh, he's going to tell you about the overall <coughs> national export uh, initiative that he helps to direct. But in particular, he's also going to focus on uh, the agency's efforts in uh, the doing business in Africa initiative. Over to you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you for the introduction and for your service and for your friendship. Uh, Congressman Pass, thank you for helping organize this. <clears throat> Congressman Rangel and Payne and Meadows, thank you for being here and, of course, uh, the diplomatic corps. The President stated that Africa is poised to be the next great economic success story. And that belief is really what's been driving our <clears throat> elevation of increased engagement economically in the region. 
But that belief also stems from the fact that seven of the 10 fastest growing countries in the world are in Sub-Saharan Africa. IMF predicts between five to six percent growth in the next year. And, and from our perspective, um, trade with Sub-Saharan Africa has tripled in the last decade. In fact, last year it was $22.6 billion, an increase of 5% from the year before, but that's just a fraction of trade in the U.S. And we think that we have an opportunity to really increase that. And that's one of the reasons why the President issued a strategy uh, to Sub-Saharan Africa last June. And one of the core elements of that strategy involved increasing our trade and investment in the region. And a core component of that pillar was the Doing Business in Africa campaign. Um, this campaign was launched earlier in the fall by the Acting Secretary of Commerce, along with a number of agencies. But who were there in this campaign really is about two things. First, it's about educating U.S. businesses about the opportunities in the Sub-Saharan Africa region. And second, it's about linking them to the resources uh, that exist. Um, and at its core, it's really about shifting the narrative. You know, when businesses read the paper these days, they read about drones in Niger, civil war in Mali, corruption in Kenya. They're not reading about the opportunities in Angola or Mozambique. And so the Doing Business Campaign is a whole government approach, and that's why it's run out of our office, the National Export Initiative and the Trade Promotion Coordinating Committee. We are working across all the agencies. As, as Lee and Elizabeth mentioned, financing is a huge component of this, and you're going to hear from our colleague at Exxon Bank as well, but we're also working closely with folks at the State Department, USAID, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, Ag and Energy, and across all of the trade promotion um, coordinating community agencies. So a couple of things that we're doing through the DBA campaign. One is, is increasing our, our engagement in terms of trade promotion efforts, which means more trade missions to the region. It means more international buyer programs, which is where we have ambassadors from the region actually bringing buyers to specific trade shows. And we actually had um, U.S. ambassador to Nigeria here um, attending a number of trade shows. And I think that's an area where we get the diplomatic core involved in, in, in a higher level as well. This also means training our counselors on the ground. We have um, local U.S. export assistance centers of commerce throughout the country. And what we've been doing is training them on the opportunities in the sub-Saharan Africa region and also how to counsel these companies. And we all know that there are challenges in exporting to Sub-Saharan Africa. Not every company is going to be ready to export to the region, and we want our counselors to be trained up to understand what those opportunities are. And that also means taking a sectoral approach. Um, you heard Elizabeth and Lee talk about some of the sectors. Well, infrastructure is definitely a sector that we're focused on, and working with TDA and OPIC and Exxon to focus on some of these infrastructure opportunities, as well as with MCC. Um, and then linking it to resources that we have, like the Advocacy Center at the Department of Commerce. In other sectors, energy, and in other sectors, agribusiness. And when we think about agribusiness, we're also trying to take a holistic approach and integrate the uh, Department of Agriculture and USAID's program for Feed the Future. Now, what we want to do with some of our strategies is also make sure that they're accessible to you all. So we have a website at www.export.gov slash Africa that includes MCC compacts and includes information um, that you've heard from other agencies, but we want uh, more feedback from you all as well. Because ultimately, we want to be able to make sure that we are getting the word out to the private sector and leveraging the private sector. We know that there's great investment from uh, companies like Intel and Microsoft and companies like Black & Beach, by the way, who have a skills and transfer program, um, which I think is one of the reasons why you see a real hunger for American businesses to invest in the region. When American businesses come into the region, we are investing in the local economies and we're training people and we're developing these skills transfer programs. Uh, but it's not just about the larger companies, it's, all about, it's also about the smaller companies and making sure that we get the word out uh, of companies throughout the U.S. who are trading and investing in the region and also leveraging the diaspora community that we have here in the U.S. We know that we have one of the largest diaspora communities in the world and we want to make sure that we are leveraging that. We've had an event at the White House um, and a number of other forms, but we want to make sure that we're doing an even better job uh, with that. And understanding that there also are, are some complications with doing business, we have some policy letters that we want to be following, one of which is the East African Commercial Dialogue, uh, which was launched in Kenya in the fall. It's a way for us to better engage with the East African community to drive some better regional integration and focus on some, some key trade facilitation uh, issues. So again, this, this Doing Business in Africa campaign is a platform, it's a foundation. You all have been doing uh, this work for many, many years, and we really want to get your ideas and feedback. So we'll look forward to the Q&A.
time. So now we've heard about some of our efforts in promoting business in Africa. Now we will turn to Vivian Van Todd, who is the Senior Business Development Officer for Africa at the Export Import Bank. Uh, Benjamin uh, Todd has worked at Exxon for over five years and oversees a $6 billion uh, portfolio. In the five years he's worked at Exxon, uh, Exxon the portfolio has, uh, has grown its annual credit authorization from $500 million to over $1.5 billion. He's assisted in, in the origination and underwriting of both small and large transition, uh, transactions in over 44 countries across Africa. So that's almost all of Africa. And we're very interested in hearing the great experience of the Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. Thank you, uh, Dr. Freeman Bass, Mr. Ayn Rangel, and fellow panelists, and of course the diplomatic board of the friends I see right here in front of me. So it makes me a little bit nervous. <laughs> um, I can say first and foremost that Exim Bank is definitely bullish on Africa. Much like um, what Elizabeth Littlefield has talked about, and Zach, Mike, um, we have seen our portfolio triple. 2008, about 500 million. And actually, prior to that, it was around 400 to 500 million of annual credit on Last year we did 1.5 billion. We look at our pipeline of future transactions. We're looking at doing transactions in over 30 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we just see the amounts increasing. Why are we bullish on Africa? Well, we've heard it um, from the other panelists. The economic fundamentals are becoming increasingly sound. It's an easier place to do business than it was 10 years ago. The debt burdens of many of the governments are low, thanks to debt relief and other efforts. But there's one thing that is still somewhat weak. Private sector credit as a percent of GDP is very low in many of these countries. This is where entities like OPEC and like Exim can provide the financing gaps necessary for not only the large transactions, but the small transactions as well. Just a little bit of background, as many of you know, Exim Bank, we are the official export credit agency of the U.S. government. Um, we finance U.S. exports. All of our financing is made in the USA. So, um, we last year had a record-breaking year of $36 billion globally, supported about 255,000 jobs and about 3,400 companies in the U.S. We're not a development bank. We're an export credit agency. Our focus is U.S. jobs. Uh, but I do, I must say that everything that we do, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, has a developmental impact. We finance a number of large transactions. Um, many of you know our, our work in the aircraft industry. We finance Ethiopian Airlines, we finance Kenya Airways, for example. We financed Transnet, which is the state logistics provider in um, South Africa. You can't get your goods out to world markets if you don't have a proper rail system. We've even financed uh, power plants. We financed ESCOM. We've done power plants in Benin as well, supporting a company called Combustion Associates International in Corona, California. A small woman-owned business, and, and she's actually a Kenyan by birth. It's a great story. Now, everybody thinks Exim Bank, all you do are the big transactions. Well. 88% of our transactions last year supported small businesses. And did you know that most small businesses seem to sell to small businesses? And what's very important for small businesses anywhere, especially in Africa, is the cash conversion cycle. Our export credit insurance, we insure U.S. companies that sell on open accounts, Ship my product, pay me in 90 days, is so important for companies in Africa because that doesn't tie up their working capital, especially the small businesses. Let me give you a couple of examples. Congressman Bass, you must know American Trading International, but right in LA. We support them all over the world, but also with Showa Trading and Industry PLC in Ethiopia. Small transaction, $10,000. We've supported fishing lures 
fishing groups of all things. From a company in Springfield, Illinois, to a company of six people in South Africa. That transaction, that insurance policy performed, and they've increased that policy from $50,000 to $80,000 to $100,000. There's, there's examples of these all across the country. And um, for example, Advanced Protein Systems in Phoenix, Arizona that sold uh, milk products to BZD Group Limited in Fort Harcourt. So it's these types of small connections that not only help U.S. businesses, they also tremendously help the small businesses as well. We also very much support doing business in Africa campaign. Um, our biggest constraint is the lack of U.S. exports that are being sold to Africa. And so we like to work with our interagency partners, TDA, OPIC, and even on the OPIC softball team. <laughs> um, and as well with Commerce State and everyone else with this whole of government approach to kind of improve U.S. exports into sub-Saharan Africa. 